Well, this is the third week we've been looking at this idea of a 180 life, a life that goes against the way that our culture is doing things. And we know the, that more and more, as Daniel mentioned, our culture is becoming more post-Christian, and it's getting tougher and tougher to swim upstream. But at the same time, it's so much easier to be a light and make a difference, as we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about salt and light. And I think this idea of a, that we're a city on the hill doesn't mean we isolate or pull away from our community and from our city. It means we're an alternative. We're, we're an alternate city within the city, a place where people can see that we do life differently. And that's what I love about K-groups. And just to, again, just plug K-groups in Wednesday night, because we need one another. If, if we're going to be going against culture six days out of the week, five days out of the week, we're in the mix of it, and we're trying to do life differently. We're trying to handle money differently. We're trying to speak differently. We're acting differently. And we know that it can be tough, and it can, we can feel very alone. And we need one another to strengthen one another. And Scripture talks about spurring each other on and encouraging one another. And an area that we're looking at today, and particularly in our society, is getting harder and harder to, um, to, to see that, you know what, if we're going to do life differently, we are going to get a lot of pushback. We're going to get a lot of resistance. In fact, we're going to be in the minority. But God's called us to be a light and salt for Him. And I, I, just, I just want to read this uh, from, this is from Psychology Today, because this is unbelievable as we talk about God's idea of what a healthy marriage looks like and what, what a relationship is supposed to look like and what we're supposed to be in our pure in heart and mind and actions. It says, this is straight from Psychology Today, there are both healthy and unhealthy reasons for having extramarital affairs. There are many women and men whose extramarital Involvements are purely an expression of curiosity, personal growth, or the manifestation of a varietal disposition. All right, that's basically saying, basically, you know, I need to do something different, right? It's so sad, and it sums up the article. The bottom line is, not all marriages in which spouses have had an affair is a bad marriage, and not all people who remain sexually faithful are in happy marriages. And there are many reasons why people have sex outside of marriage, and not all of them are unhealthy. I mean, we, we do laugh, and we, and we think, because it's so, so contrary to Christianity, and it's so, so contrary to what Jesus has called us to live. And as we look in the Sermon on the Mount, and we see what the kingdom ethic is, what God desires for us to live like as Christians, and how we're supposed to live, we follow a king and his kingdom looks so different than this world's kingdom. And no other probably passage in the Sermon on the Mount stands out in contrast like Matthew 5, 27 through 30, because Jesus says, you know what, it's, it's, it's one thing to do the right thing physically, but even mentally you can do the wrong thing and still be in sin. And our culture just laughs about that. Let's look at these verses, verse 27 through 30. Jesus says, you have heard it was said... You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell." Let's pray and we'll look at this, these verses. God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us truth that we're not left to, to our feelings or to our emotions or just how the, the culture is just directing us and, the, and just the, the mood of the day, God, but you, your word gives us truth as we looked at last week and it gives us a foundation from which to build our lives, not just for your glory, but for our good. We know that your commandments are for our good and, and to prosper us and give us hope and a future, God, and we, we do believe that to be true. And, and God, I pray that today that we will bank our lives upon your truth. God, help those who are in the midst of struggles in these areas we're going to talk about, God. We pray for grace. We pray for strength. We pray for focus for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the Sermon on the Mount passage, Jesus is going to go through a series of, you've heard it said, and then he says, but I say. And what is he talking about there? Is he saying he disagrees with the Old Testament scriptures and he's going to tell you a better way of doing it? Absolutely not. In fact, what Jesus is saying, he's saying, 
Here is what the Old Testament, which is, is good, is truth, and it's life. Here's what it says, but there's a misunderstanding among your rabbis, your spiritual leaders, of what the, really the correct interpretation of that is. And as God, and as the Messiah, and as Jesus, I'm going to tell you, here's what the way that it should be interpreted. And when he says, you have heard, he's referring to the seventh commandment, and the Ten Commandments, and the Seventh Commandment clearly tells us not to commit adultery. But Jesus, during Jesus' time, the religious teachers and the rabbis limited the scope of this commandment as strictly as possible to view it as only as if you actually committed the act. And here's the interesting thing. It was really built upon this idea of personal property. The fact that don't commit adultery because this person is property of another person, and if you c commit adultery, it's almost like you're a thief, which they totally ignored the deeper concept and the concept God cared about, which was the purity aspect of this. And so Jesus is showing what the purpose of this law actually was. But they found it very convenient to ignore the Tenth Commandment, which talks about coveting your neighbor's wife. And some way they were able to massage this and make it say what was comfortable to them. And Jesus corrects them on that. Unless we sit back and say, how could they just ignore Scripture? Let's make sure we point this at ourselves and think about all the Scriptures that we ignore and look past and justify things because they're convenient to us. And so let's kind of go back to a little bit from the beginning what God's intention was for relationships and marriage in the first place that we've been created for a need for intimacy. When God created Adam, he created someone who he could have a relationship with. He walked with, with God in the garden. He communed with God. But in spite of the fact that God said that everything he created was good and perfect, yet when Adam went through and he named the animals, what happened? He said there was no suitable helper in Genesis 2 found for Adam. Think about that. Here was a sinless man in perfect fellowship with God in a perfect environment. What more could you possibly want? Yet it isn't enough. Not according to God, anyway, in this verse. God's evaluation was that a man needed a union, needed union companionship. And he needed a partner. He needed a mate. And look at verse 23, Genesis 2, 23 and 24. The man said, when the woman was, was taken from his rib, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So shall uh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So this one flesh idea, this intimacy idea. So God created and designed marriage as the primary way for our need for intimacy to be met. Not our only, we'll talk about this in a minute, not our only outlet for to find intimacy. We, we need Christians, brothers and sisters as well but our primary relationship. And then also, he created marriage as an illustration. So not just, not just for companionship, not just for intimacy, but as a Christian in a marriage, we are to be a model of Christ in his church. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Paul says, this is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife, my, the wife must respect her husband. And so this idea of this intimacy, is not only, it's, this is not just mystical, but this is real life that we become one with one another. And we'll look at that more in a minute. We're just going to do a little overview here. And then the, the next thing is that we see in Scripture is marriage is a covenant before God. Marriage is a covenant before God. And look, don't let that just go in one ear and out the other, because this idea of covenant, we think maybe Old Testament scriptures, we think of a Bible, and it's not a word that we use a lot anymore. We've grown up in an age of consumerism. And consumerism says, I want something, and I'm willing to pay for it, as long as you provide me the service that makes me happy. But once you stop doing that, or I don't feel like it's economical for me, then I leave that relationship, and I go on to another relationship. So it's all about me getting my needs met. But biblical covenant, biblical marriage was a covenant. And this idea required a promise to be faithful. And it almost always re, uh, re involved a curse that if you broke this covenant, if you broke your promise, that 
there would be a curse that happened. And so, let's define adultery in terms of that. Adultery is sex outside of a covenant or sex without a covenant. Let's say that again. Adultery is sex outside of a covenant or sex without a covenant. So it covers the whole scope. It covers single people and it covers married people who are being unfaithful. So sex within the covenant God created is a way to say, I belong to you. And the Bible teaches us, even though that sometimes in some of our traditions we were raised in, sometimes sex is a very uncomfortable topic to speak on or talk about, and people who are raised in certain traditions, they look at it almost like a dirty word, but the Bible never teaches that. The Bible teaches that it's a good thing. Everything God made in Genesis, he said, it was perfect, it was good. And in fact, if you've read through your Bible, you come to a book called Song of Solomon, and God devotes an entire book of his word to this idea of biblical romance, to this idea of romance. But we see in Scripture that sexual intimacy is so much more than just a physical act that happens between two people. It involves emotions, personality, spirituality. It involves all of us, our souls, our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives us this example of kind of the triangle that I showed earlier, God and us. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Should a man take his body which is part of Christ, and join it with a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one with her? For Scripture says the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then he goes on to say, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against one's own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God in your body. So it's not just a mystical thing. This is a practical thing that when you're joined as one to someone else, you make choices together, you make decisions together. Things that you do affect one another and influence one another. Sex makes you want to covenant with someone. Do you understand what I'm saying? It makes you want to covenant. It's not just some idle thing that you do physically that there's nothing attached to it. I recall in high school that, that we would notice you know, when a couple would start to have sexual relations with one another because there was just this bond that happened between them that was indistinguishable, the jealousy, the possessiveness. And during those times of life, you know, you looked at the person like they're a little crazy because the guy would get so mad if the girl talked to someone else or whatever. But this is the way God intended sex to work, that when you covenant with someone physically, there is a spiritual, there's a soul bond that happens there. And so God warns us and he tells us that when we give our body to someone else without this covenant, we're doing violence against ourself. And when we say, I want sex, but I don't want you, or I don't love you enough to be married to you, basically you're spitting in God's face and saying, God, you don't know what you're talking about, this covenant idea. And then another interesting thing is this idea of covenant, to stay with this theme. Throughout Scripture, when God ordained a covenant, oftentimes he would have a covenant renewal ceremony where he would remind people of the covenant they made. And I read this, this is really great, and I can't say it near as good as Tim Keller did in his book, so I'm just going to read it to you. It says, The Bible is full of covenant renewal ceremonies. When God enters into a personal relationship with someone, he is not so unrealistic as to think that mere emotions can serve as the basis for it. He knows that human emotions come and go, and that there needs to, and there needs to be something binding to provide consistency and endurance. So God requires a binding, public, legal covenant as the infrastructure for intimacy. It is far easier to be vulnerable to someone who has a binding promise to be exclusively faithful to you than to someone who is under no obligation to stay with you for more than one night. Thus, God demands covenants. 
But even that is not enough. He regularly gets his people together to reread the terms of the covenant, remember the history of his acts of grace in their lives, and recommit themselves through renewal of the covenant. And then this, this block of the text is up on the screen. I want you to follow along. It says, Marriage is a covenant, one that creates a place for security, of security for vulnerability. But though covenant is necessary for sex, sex is also necessary for covenant. The covenant will grow stale unless we continually revisit and reenact it. Sex is a covenant renewal ceremony for marriage. The physical reenactment of the inseparable oneness in all other areas, economic, legal, personal, psychological, created by the marriage covenant. Sex renews and revigorates the marriage covenant. And that's the idea we get from this oneness, this one flesh that takes place in marriage. This covenant exists that should not, under any circumstances other than one limitation, one, one exception that Jesus gives, Marital unfaithfulness. And even that isn't just a license to say, oh, you were unfaithful, so I'm divorcing you. God constantly re, re-emphasizes this fact that this one flesh, if you, it's like tearing a person apart. And we'll talk more about that next week when Jesus talks about divorce. But sex is, is a great, real practically, is a great test in your marriage. If it's not working in your marriage, you need to look under the surface and see, What's going on? What's wrong in your relationship? Because chances are, it's an indicator of a deeper issue that's unresolved. And I encourage you, if you find yourself in that place where you know that you you guys are just basically roommates, and you're just totally on different tracks and going totally different directions, what you need is somebody to help you, somebody to sit down with you and help you negotiate and work together and come with compromises to situations that you can't resolve because it's playing out into every area of your marriage, including your sex life, and it's ultimately not bringing glory to God, plain and simple. You're not honoring God in your life and the way that you should be treating one another. And so while sex isn't the dominant intimacy thing or trumps all other things, it's a great indicator of what's going on in our life. But too many Christians, i found practically, just they make excuses. If that covenant relationship isn't working, if life isn't going well in their sex life, I see way too many people, and I'm sure Chris can attest to this as well, way too many people who think that's an excuse to go out and look for something else. Or they try to, just like the Pharisees and the scribes, they try to massage the, the, the Scripture and say, well, they've abandoned me emotionally, or they've abandoned me physically, so I have a right, therefore, to commit adultery. And they try to find a loophole. But let's be clear in this passage of Scripture that God, through the words of Christ, through Jesus' words, makes it clear that there's no loopholes for us here. And the problem is too many Christians want a God who will save us from hell but doesn't invade our sexual freedom. But Jesus says you can't have both of those things. You can't have, I got my security of heaven, but then I got freedom to live the way I want to live. That doesn't work. Does, it's not compatible. And most importantly, sex outside of marriage destroys you. You can't have intimacy with God, you can't enjoy God, and you can't fulfill God's purposes in your life. So sex is delightful, but it's also dangerous. And just like Paul said, when we sin, it's a sin that's against our own body, the temple of God. So sex is going to take you in one direction or the other. And this 180 idea that you're either going toward God and obeying Him and doing what He says, or you're going against His will. Interesting, another thing I read was about a, about a pastor who, when his college students would come home uh, for breaks and for winter break or for the summer, he would, as many as that he could, he would take out and say, let's go out and have a coffee together and would sit down and talk. And he, and he said it never failed. He began to sit down and talk and a lot of students would begin talking about their difficulties and doubts, you know, with struggling. Now they've taken a philosophy class or they've taken some science class. They start, they're, they're struggling with, you know, really their faith and whether they believe in God or their foundations being shooken. And he said this, he said, I would look at him and I would say, who are you sleeping with? And, and they would be taken back for a minute. And what? what, what, what? 
But he said eventually many of them would ultimately open up and begin talking about how they failed miserably in this area. And here was his conclusion. He said that it was um, pretty easy to see that these questions and these struggles they were having really were rooted to this prior issue of a troubled conscience. Just they, they, they were struggling because these aren't compatible. You can't embrace God. You can't embrace living for Jesus, being passionate for Jesus. Yet over here, you're just fulfilling whatever impulses and desires that you have. And so you have a crisis of belief there. You have a problem. And what are you going to do? Are you going to disbelieve or are you going to obey God in this area of your life? And so as Daniel mentioned, we have quite a few college students going off. We have college students here and not just college students. I heard this to be true for nursing homes are a place where lots of adultery and fornication happen, believe it or not. People, single people, it's hardwired in us. I know some of the younger people are like, what? But the truth is God created us all to desire intimacy, but he gave, no matter if you're 75 or if you're 25, there's boundaries within God's commands to keep for your good and for his glory. And so these kids coming home, they would have these questions, but the problem was they had to figure out what they were going to do to keep these things compatible, and they usually just gave up their belief systems because it was easy. And then next, Jesus turns to lust, and he makes it even tougher. He says it's not enough just to not commit adultery. He says, you can commit adultery in your heart. You can commit adultery in your mind. Verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So this idea, if you look at a woman to, in order to lust. Now, he's not saying that if you just notice someone or you just see someone, but he says, and we know the difference between looking and looking to lust looking with intent. And we know good and well in our society what lust is. And if we know ourselves very well, we know what lust is. Lust is about instant fulfillment. Lust is about meeting my needs. I don't care about you. I don't want a commitment to you. I don't want any strings attached. All I'm looking for is a thrill, and you're just there to be used to get what I need. How different that is from love. What does love do? Love cares about the person. It values the person. A person created in the image of God. And love says, this is about me. It's about me meeting my needs, my desires. You're just a sex object. You're not really a person. And that's just not compatible with kingdom living, kingdom thinking. In our society, like no other society, it's funny, today I don't have to tell any funny jokes or stories to keep your attention, do I? I mean, it's just like everybody's zoned in on this. In our society, we know, like no other society, because of the internet, the, the availability of pornography, the fact that it's so, so easy to fall into that trap. And the thing is, most people who are trapped in this you know that it's true that this will destroy intimacy and create disaster. You're inviting disaster into your life because it gives you this promise of intimacy, but it never delivers. Because ultimately what we're doing, we're, we're seeking connection with another person. We're seeking connection with God. But Jesus knew. And these are Jesus' words, all right? And some of you are sitting there saying, how can we talk about this in church? Jesus talked about it. Amen. And we better address it because the truth is, Your teenagers know about it. Your kids know about it. They're being exposed at an incredibly young age. And truthfully, there's not a whole lot we can do. And and when I was in Texas, our junior high pastor got this software that supposedly was going to keep kids off internet pornography, but he wanted to try it out, so he put a couple of middle school kids in his room in his his office to use the internet while he was going to be gone for a few minutes. And he said within 10 minutes he walked back and they had already broken through. Kids, young kids. I know many, many people who have talked to me who were exposed at 10, 11, 12, and I was a part of this Internet generation growing up. We didn't have Internet. But now everybody has availability to it at such a a young age. And we have no idea, truthfully, what the long-term effects of this are going to be. But there are some studies starting to come out to show 
The fact that, the, that, that it just destroys this intimacy, it hurts the way that we view our wife, the way we, we view sex. It shapes and rewires our brains in such a way that we don't look at women, guys, the way that we should look at them. And we no longer can direct our sexual drives in an appropriate way. And these studies are coming out. I read one by Josh McDowell that he authorized. He said, it's, just, it's, it's terrible the harm that it's causing. So what do we do with this? Thursday, I was in the coffee shop, and I was sitting there with my computer preparing for this. And a gentleman came over, and we were just chatting and talking, and he made this statement. He didn't even know what I was talking about. I don't know how this came up. And he said, uh, you know what's wrong with religion? Guilt, torture, and frustration. That's what's wrong with religion. And I see, in, in, in a way, I see his point, if he's talking about religion and not talking about a relationship with Jesus. Because the truth is, far too many people are held captive by this by lust, by extramarital affairs. And it, and it throws so much guilt and shame and torture in their life that many people walk away from the faith, just like these college students, because they think, I'm a failure. I can't do this. It's too hard. It's too difficult. And many people live, true Christians, live in a state of being, feeling defeated all the time. They can't live for God. They can't make a difference. They can't serve because... All they feel is shame. I'm not worth anything. And Satan loves that. He wants you to feel worth, worthless for God's kingdom. If he can keep you in that spot where you're feeling that way, he's won. He's won. So what do we do? Let me give you some practical things that you can do. First of all, believe the gospel. If you're a believer, believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians, or, or I'm sorry, Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Did you just hear that? He said that through our faith in Jesus, that God took our sins and nailed them to the cross. He forgave us our sin. The theological word for that is justification. It means he's declared us righteous. You are righteous. When I, God says, when I see you, I see the blood of Jesus Christ. I see the blood of Jesus Christ. And in that, we find hope and confidence and the ability to live the life that God's lived, called us to live because we realize that we don't have to be held captive who we are in Christ. We're going to talk about this a lot over the next weeks in the book of Ephesians. But who we are in Christ, we're new creatures. Old things have passed away. All has become new. God has said these sins don't have to hold us down because they've been forgiven, wiped clean. That's why Jesus came. And Jesus gave up his rights to come to this earth. And we can do the same thing too. We can love people. Because God loved us through Jesus. We can be committed to other people above our own needs. We can love and serve. And as followers of Jesus, our life should be defined by loving others, not a selfish life that says, I need this for me, or I deserve this, or this, this is the way that I was wired or created. But it says, no, I'm a new creature. I live for others. I live to serve Jesus and others. So lust is defined by what's my needs, what fulfills me now. Adultery says, I deserve this. If my marriage commitment doesn't fulfill me, I have to find myself. I deserve it. Jesus said, if you're going to find life, you have to lose your life. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The thing practically I see in my own life and so many other people who can bear witness to this, the truth is that if we're committed to one another and we have this covenant relationship with one another and God is here and we're moving toward God, the intimacy grows stronger and better over the years. And the level of connection that we can have isn't limited by age or our looks because it's driven by God. 
and our love for him and in turn his spirit can work through us. And that's the second thing. Seek the beauty of Jesus with all your heart and you will begin to develop self-control. How do I know that? Because the fruit of the spirit, self-control. If we're in the word and walking in the spirit, self-control will begin to be produced in our lives. And it's not overnight that all of a sudden we just have the perfect self-control to to say no to everything. There's going to be failures and struggles. But the more we gaze upon the beauty of Jesus and we see the cross and see what God has done for us through Jesus and the cross, in that we have the fruits of the Spirit begin to develop in us. Don't make this mistake. I did this when I was in college. I would focus so much on the fruit. I need self-control. I need love. I need joy. But fruit comes about because the tree is rooted and is healthy. Get to know God. Focus on Jesus and his greatness. And those fruit will begin to be produced. Jesus said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. You want to see God? Purity in heart. Spirit-led self-control. Number three, fight anything that gets between you and Jesus. Fight anything that gets between you and Jesus. A minute ago when I was talking about justification, I was talking about how that Jesus had forgiven all our sins through the cross. If you sit there and your thoughts go to this, hmm, so if if he's forgiven all of my sins, then I can do whatever I want to do because it's forgiven. you got a serious problem if that thought's entered your mind and you better start getting in serious conversation with God. Scripture makes it clear that if justification sounds like a license for us to go on sinning, there's a deep problem at the heart of our relationship with Christ. So Jesus said, if you don't fight lust, you can't be part of my kingdom. Not that we'll always succeed, but we will fight. There has to be a desire to fight within us. Look what he said in verse 29 through 30. He said, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, Cut it off. Is he saying to mutilate yourself? I don't think so. I think what he's saying is take drastic action because the truth is, and there have been people throughout history who have actually taken this literally and done this, but the problem is it doesn't change your heart because you gouge your eye out. Or if you cut your hand off, your heart's still wicked and evil. I think Jesus was saying, do whatever you need to do to root out that sin. Deal radically with it. And I I love this statement. I I saw someone wrote this. They said, in order for you to control yourself, you may have to do things that look very drastic, things that may look make you look disfigured to this culture. You get that? Culturally disfigured. Why are you why don't you do that? Because I know myself better than you know that. I, I just can't I can't go there. I can't do that. I can't be around them. What's wrong with you? Are you a pervert or something? No, I'm not. I just understand that, you know what? i got to gouge my eye out. i got to cut my arm off because I know what I'm capable of doing. I know what I'm capable of doing. I know that I can fall. I told you, told you all a few months back about how that I made some mistakes of uh, trying to uh, rig up my own fireplace, a gas fireplace, and, and blew the thing up. And, and, and when the, all this was going on, at, at, there was some gas that had got caught up underneath the, uh, the, the whatever that thing's called, where, the, where the, the smoke goes up. Some gas got caught up in there behind the fireplace. And uh, anyway, I wasn't aware of that, but I saw some flames and some sparks going on at the bottom. So what I had to do, I got down on my hands and knees and started trying to blow that stuff out, blow the flame out. The problem was that all these combustible gases were there. And so once that flame hit it, it was gone. And the thing is, some of y'all are flirting around with some things. And you think, well, it's flames. It's little. It's tiny. It's not a big deal. But it's only a matter of time before the things that you do are just going to blow up. Blow your life up. Blow your marriage up. Blow your testimony up. And it's always, be sure your sin will find you out. This always comes back to us. So eliminate everything. Even things that are innocent, eliminate them from your life. If you want to take Jesus' words literally, eliminate them from your life, those things 
that may, and it may even cause you to be culturally disfigured. I, I asked some, uh, some people, I said, you know, obviously all this is going to come from a man's point of view here because I, you know, I don't tend to understand women. I have no clue, you know, how, how you guys work and, and half the audience at least is your women. So I went and, and looked and asked and talked and, and, and I came up with a statement from a lady and I thought this really applied because it's not just a man issue. Um, she says, just as sexual pornography twists and understanding for men about real women's bodies and sexual appetites, so romantic pornography twists the perception for women about real men and how they ought to behave toward women, which tends to amount to, well, behaving like a woman. And she goes on to say, in fact, romantic porno- pornography has a ring, to, a ring of truth to it, which is one reason it's powerful. And so she says, be careful that you don't idolize and look at these things and think, oh, if only my man could be like this or my man could be like that and begin to allow these fantasies to play in your mind. It's the same thing, romantic pornography. She, said, she goes on to say, she says, um, Scripture is clear that Jesus, the ultimate bridegroom, is jealous and pursues his bride, the church. So, men, this isn't a free pass. This says that we need to pursue our wives. But at the same time, wives, we have a, you have a responsibility to understand that your man is different than you. He's not wired exactly the way you are wired. He doesn't look at situations the way that you look at them. And you need to understand that you don't need to conform him and make him into something. Our, our, our society is just hell-bent on feminizing guys, plain and simple. Let him be a man. God created a man and a woman. That was his perfect scenario. That's his will. He knows what he's doing. I sure don't because sometimes we just look and say, oh, um, don't understand. They look at us and say, where did you come from? But there's a reason behind that. We're compa- we help each other. We're compatible. We help each other see things from different perspectives, and we complement one another. Let's don't compete with one another. Number five, develop deep Jesus-centered relationships. Deep Jesus-centered relationships. And here, I just I know there's not a ton of single people in the room, but there are definitely single people in the room. You know, if you're sitting there and you're 15 years old and you're thinking, okay, by cultural standards, the best case scenario, I'll be married in 10 years. How in the world am I supposed to make it for the next 10 years? Or maybe you're, you're divorced and you think, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced that intimacy and I know what it's like and how great it is. And I just can't live without that. I got, I've got, you know, to keep looking around and maybe find somebody who will marry me or get married or find somebody who's compatible. And, and, but until then, you know, I've just got to, you know, do what I have to do to meet my needs. The thing is, I think is so true is that oftentimes our desire for sexual intimacy um, is trumped, like I said, it's, it's made so big in our culture that sometimes we miss it that our real desire is just for intimacy in general, for people to know us, to understand us, to have people who are, who are good, close friends. As my friend Jeff Oldham says, that we're in the foxhole together, that we can talk about anything. We can bring out into the light those things that Satan wants to keep in the darkness. And so I encourage you to be around people, singles, be around people who are like-minded as you are, who can be really people who can help you and encourage you through all this. And then the final thing, number six, forget what's behind. Hebrews says, I forget what's behind and I run the race. Some of you have had major failures in this area. You have a history that seems to keep holding you back. You've had relationships that just have destroyed you emotionally, physically. You have secrets in your life that nobody knows about. Satan wants to hold you back from living for God and being a citizen of the kingdom who lives for the kingdom principles. He wants to do that. What should you do? If you've not confessed it to God, first and foremost, you need to confess and repent. Say, God... That's not compatible. I know it's not compatible with living for you. I confess that it's sin. That's what confession means, to say the same thing as agree with God. God, that's a sin. That emotional relationship I have with that person at work, it's a sin. That pornography is a sin. That fantasizing, sin. Call it what it is. Confess it. 
And then some of you need to, maybe your spouse doesn't know, or maybe she knows or he knows, and it's caused so much damage in your relationship that you're lacking that intimacy. Samaritan's Counseling Center, Chris Beam, awesome resource that goes to church here. He, he meets with lots of people. Confidentiality is high on his list. He's not going to ever tell anybody or talk to anybody or look at you differently because you go see him, and there's other counselors there that may be more appropriate for you to talk to. Pastoral staff, we have elders who are very wise and been married for many years. Talk to someone. Seek someone out. Get some direction on what to do. This is something that we just can't say, I'm just too hard. I'm just going to go with the culture. I, I won't go totally with the culture, but I'll just go a little bit because it won't be long before our country does look like England and, and our lives are just so lacking a passion and just going through a religious motions and there's no strength or authority behind our words. And Satan will have the victory. Jesus said, don't commit adultery. Don't look at a woman to lust after her. Let's honor God in our thoughts and our actions. Father God, we know that left to ourselves, this would seem nearly impossible. But God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit you've put in within the true believers, God, those who know you, to give us strength and power to live differently in this culture, to reject the attitudes of the day and the, and the philosophies of the day, God, and live lived by your word, which stands forever, that will never be shaken. God, for those who today feel an extreme amount of remorse or, or guilt or, 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 or healthy conviction, God, I pray today that they'll go to you and run to you with this, God. And help them to walk out of here willing to culturally disfigure themselves if necessary to have victory in these areas, God. Help this not just to be a sermon we easily forget. Help us to remember the words of Jesus and see the consequences of just not doing anything that just proves that we're not truly in your kingdom in the first place. Help us to fight and war and battle through your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.